Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the April 5th meeting of the Housing Opportunities Commission. And I'd like to welcome those members of the public who are participating with us on YouTube. And thank you for your interest in our activities and we welcome you to this, to this meeting. I can introduce to you the members of our commission who are present today, and we've got a full complement of commissioners today. Um, and to my immediate left is our vice chair, Van Kelleher. To my immediate right is, is our is our staff of Tim, <laughs> Jeffrey Merkowitz. Um, I'm seeing new people around me now. So. <laughs> Uh, here's a meeting with right? Jackie Simon, a lot from you too. Uh, former chair of the commission, also a commissioner, and Rick Nelson, former chair of Pro Tem. So welcome them. And to my immediate left, our friend is Linda Coons, our commissioner, and also Pamela Bird, commissioner. So we want to, all of us want to welcome you to this meeting, and we will proceed with the agenda unless there is some request to amend the agenda. Seeing none, we will proceed. The first part of our meeting is the information exchange. We have been advised that there has been no request for anyone to participate in the community forum. So we'll proceed with the next item on the agenda, which is a report of the executive director. And we can certainly welcome you back, Chelsea. We can see that you've been somewhere where you had access to some sun. Um, I, I, I am here now. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners, members of the public, and the HLC team. I'm pleased to share an update as it pertains to HLC's activities in the month of March 2023. Um, this month, we will highlight our first ever procurement fair. And I do want to ask the team to please um, preview the PowerPoint. Um, you will hear information related to our first ever um, HLC procurement fair legislative updates, highlights from our resident services division, the community development block grant update, updates from our housing resource division, real estate development activities, and the finance division update. Starting with, um, and I'd like the team to go to page three of the PowerPoint. I will um, proceed with starting, but there are definitely some um, really nice visuals that give context as it pertains to the mo uh, an extremely successful event that we hosted um, on March 15th. It was HLC's first ever procurement fair. We held it at the Silver Spring Civic Building, um, and we had an opportunity to encourage new business owners to understand more about how to do business with HLC. Page three. That included a focus on um, small businesses, diverse businesses, and other um, professionals who have yet to do business with HLC, as well as some of our ongoing business partners who joined us at that event. Um, wonderful turnout, over 75 um, different organizations were represented, and we did engage in a customer service feedback uh, opportunity and received a 96% success rating based on participant feedback. So there was definitely um, some wonderful synergy and positive outcomes as a result of that um, Fair. In fact, we're continuing to receive feedback and requests for additional um, information as we move forward. Next slide. I'll also share some information related to legislative updates. Um, bill MC 1013, the local bill that pertains to um, HLC's collective bargaining process, did pass the House on March 20th with amendments that were negotiated with Senator Kramer. They were friendly amendments. Um, the amendment, amendment bill was passed out of the Senate Finance Committee and is awaiting passage by the Senate. Um, SB 848, which is the bill to establish a statewide voucher program in Maryland, passed the Senate and is awaiting um, action by the um, House Rules Committee. This is the bill that we spoke about previously that if passed would mandate a $15 million appropriation beginning in FY 2025 um, for a statewide voucher program. Um, Council Bill 523 is another bill that we are 
um, tracking um, as it pertains to um, how it would impact prospective employees. This particular bill relates to privacy questions that are asked um, in the current um, application process with the county in regards to health screenings and is a bill that would limit the type of questions um, that are intrusive questions that are asked. Um, it passed the council on the 21st um, and we will be working with the county and ensuring that our application process is updated accordingly. Next slide. The NARO Legislative Conference was held here in Washington, D.C. Um, NARO was celebrating 90, 90 excuse me, years of, um, of existence and um, serving all of the housing authorities across this nation. Um, through the conference, our um, commissioners and staff had an opportunity to do some advocacy work, um, had an opportunity to meet with staff from Representative Raskin's office, Senator Van Hollen's office, and Senator Cardin's office um, to advocate for affordable housing funding in the coming federal budget. I want to thank Commissioner Simon for joining us in that effort as well. Next slide. Our resident services update, we continue to engage and provide um, resources to our customers. This slide highlights some of the activities that are ongoing, including our fundamentals of housing workshop and our resource sharing workshops that occurred um, in the month of March, as well as our after school program and recreational um, movie night that we held at Paddington Square on March um, 7th. Next slide. We also um, provided financial literacy and launched a new project in, um, with PNC Bank, who's continued to be a strong partner of ours in providing financial literacy support to our residents. This particular initiative was a reality store that they hosted at one of our properties to teach our participants how to manage a monthly household budget. Um, and we also um, had a St. Patrick's Day party at both um, Spring Garden and Tanglewood. Next slide. This slide um, provides an overview of activities in terms of how we've engaged our seniors, um, including support around digital equity, arts for the aging, our health and wellness services, the food and nutrition ongoing programs that we provide, as well as the recreational outlets like Community Bingo that we provide at both Forest Oak Towers and a gardening workshop at Arcola Towers. Next slide. Our resident services team continues to support our customers um, with regards to relocation and recertification assistance, as well as ensuring that our customers are aware of and take advantage of any and all rental assistance programs. Next slide. We continue to work with our partners. Um, highlighted here are a few, um, Mana Food Center and um, Montgomery County Senior Nutritional Lunch Program and many others who provide food and resources to our customers. Over 400 customers were served in March. And we also continue to facilitate the Senior Nutrition Program. Next slide. Our um, HLC Academy continues to have robust programming for our youth. In fact, this month or in the month of March, one of our um, um, partners, IEI, who conducts the inspections, HQS inspections for our voucher program, took our um, young girls in the Girls Got It program to the NASA Goddard Visitor Center. Um, additionally, our first generation college Brown program is working with our college um, uh, aged children or students to prepare them for college and um, continue to provide STEM and STEAM workshops and activities and field trips. Next slide. <clears throat> We also continue to provide um, resources to our uh, residents and clients who are interested in workforce development opportunities, as well as small business resources, such as the business strategy course, and continue to partner with um, many of our um, partners to ensure that we continue to provide ongoing programming, such as how to create a video blog and tuition assistance for the adults in our program. Next slide. 
This slide highlights the financial literacy work that we provide to both individuals in our um, program as well as those on our waiting list. Every month, I continue to emphasize the importance of individuals of our waiting list taking advantage of this resource. It includes one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching as well as access to many um, financial literacy workshops that we offer. That information can be located on our website at hlcmc.org. Next slide. And our supportive housing division provided and um, continue to support over 228 participants with home visits, resources, case management, assisting them with paying rent and utilities. And we continue to administer the emergency voucher program and the rent supplement program. Next slide. In the month of March, our fatherhood initiative graduated 28 fathers from the March cohort and um, began enrollment for our April um, 2023 cohort. And you see um, uh, on this slide a picture of that um, uh, wonderful group of fathers who graduated in March. Next slide. I'm pleased to continue to provide updates to the commission as it pertains to the work that we've been able to do um, around getting resources out, particularly the CDBG um, program. Um, as of um, today, we have um, provided over $1.4 million in rent relief. So this program is continuing to um, um, impact our residents in a positive enrollment, the state has allowed us additional time to continue these efforts until June 30th, 2023. And I do want to applaud and thank the team who has really been instrumental in supporting this effort, our compliance team, property management team, IT, and our public affairs team. Next slide. The Housing Choice Voucher Program it, um, currently in the month of March issued 177 families with vouchers, um, 163 are pending execution, and um, over 200 families were selected from the waiting list. And um, you do see here that of the nine, there of the um, 177 families, nine requested voucher extensions, which were granted, and two of the nine um, did warrant referrals to the Human Rights Commission in the Commission on Civil Rights for Possible Discrimination. Mm -hmm. Next slide. HLC is continuing to um, introduce the use of Rent Cafe to our clients to assist with um, our annual recertifications. Um, in the month of March, out of the 300 374 out of the 612 customers did submit their paperwork electronically. We expect that number to continue to increase. For those who um, are not submitting their information electronically, we're reaching out, providing resources so that the next time they have an opportunity to submit either an interim or a research, that they um, know how they can do that in an expeditious manner online. Um, next slide. And um, our resident services counselors do continue to support families who are um, referred to, um, for termination. There were 28 families um, that did not meet program requirements. Um, and of those 28 families, we were able to assist 10 with avoiding termination and we'll continue to work with the remaining um, families to assist them in getting um, their per paperwork in and to avoid termination from the program. Next. Chelsea, just a quick question. Um, I'm always so pleased that, you know, with, that when we do the follow up and we reach mm -hmm. out and, and are able to uh, avoid terminating uh, some of those families. I mean, I see there's always some on the list that, you know, apart from deceased and vacated that, you know, just don't respond. Yes. And I'm just curious. I, I mean, do we ever find out like uh, do we ever connect with them like once they are terminated? Uh, are we, do we hear like why they didn't respond or, um, I'm certain there are probably circumstances, um, in which we learn that there might have been a ex extenuating circumstance that led to that family not responding in those cases. 
um, the, the HRD team um, would have to address those circumstances individually. Um, but I do know that, of course, there are um, a lot of efforts that take place and opportunities to even file a grievance and request um, an opportunity to be heard if, if you're recommended for termination and we weren't successful in reaching you. And even in that period of time, um, have an opportunity to remediate and address concerns. Yeah. And, yes. you know, I'm not putting any fault on the staff on this. I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, if there are opportunities to learn, like, whether there are additional ways that we should be reaching out to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of these folks that, you know, that we're not connecting with for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Absolutely. And I will um, circle back to the team as well. I, I'm hopeful, I, I'm positive that we um, take good notes in terms of what communication mechanisms we're using. And we definitely encourage our clients to keep their information updated. But I will also circle back with the team to inquire if we get feedback in regards to where the miss, miss occurred. Thanks. Yes. Next slide. Our emergency housing voucher um, um, a rollout is still positive of the 118 EHVs that we've received. We have over 96 families that have successfully leased units and 10 who are currently um, searching and staff are currently reviewing two um, packets to determine eligibility. Um, HLC continues to seek um, referrals from the HHS for this program until we reach capacity. Next slide. The Family Self-Sufficiency Program currently has enrollment of 372 families. Six new pro, um, families entered the program this month and um, staff are meeting with the Program Coordinating Committee on March 22nd, or did meet with the um, uh, PCC on March 22nd which consists of key partners who work together to provide resources to participants in our FSS program. Next slide. <clears throat> Please to share um, updates as it pertains to renovations taking place at Georgian Court and Shady Grove Apartments. Um, those uh, renovations are nearly complete. You see beautiful depictions of the community rooms and the spaces in both of these um, properties that will allow our residents to en enjoy this amenity space. And we'll continue to update as we move along in this process with these renovations. Next slide. Um, our finance division update uh, highlights the fact that on March 15th, the county executive um, presented his FY24 recommended budget, which did include a, an appropriation for the non-departmental account for services to be provided to HOC in the amount of close to $8 million. We are thankful for his recommendation and um, uh, have... Um, great uh, anticipation that the council will endorse that recommendation. Um, county funds are allocated in HLC's non-departmental account to support various functions in the agency, including resident services, um, rental license fees, our customer service centers, homeowner association fees, and utilities for our, um, and our deeply subsidized buildings. With that, um, I will pause for any questions and thank you. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, on the uh, congratulations to the 28 fathers that did graduate. But my question is, uh, do the fathers receive some type of training for a job? And does the fatherhood initiative guarantee the fathers a job? Mm -hmm. I do know that the program includes extensive um, workforce development training and opportunities, as well as referrals to job opportunities. Um, we do not guarantee employment, but we definitely work very closely with the fathers to um, provide them with referrals and opportunities, as well as um, as our Section 3 program um, allows and affords us to make referrals directly, we do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the housing choice voucher program information that you provided, which is very encouraging. One thing that I'm not as familiar with as I probably should be, it says 163 contracts are pending execution. 
can you tell me how long that process usually takes or um, is it usual to have that many cases that are pending execution? Is it a very involved process? And I'm not certain if Lynn Hayes is She's in doing the book. Yeah, she's great. She's doing oh, the book. great. Lynn, would you please step up oh, and provide guidance there? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So in answer to your question, um, by regulation, we have up to 60 days from the move-in date to execute the contract. And so these are contracts that we've sent to the landlords and we're waiting for them to send back to us to sign. And we have so many because we're doing mass call-ups every month to continue to increase the utilization. So yes, this is about normal for us. <laughs> okay, and the, for an individual lease, how what's the time that it usually takes to- To get, lease? Yeah. 90 days. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I'm always, uh, Pleased and impressed with the number of resident programs that we are doing in the HOC. Uh, notice that some of them are agency wide, family self sufficiency allows, but some of them are very property centered. You know, movie night at Paddington Square, for example. How how do you know which activity is going to go on and what property? I mean, if I was a resident, I'd be looking at our website and finding where can I go to movie night or where can I go to this or you know because it's like all these different activities are going on but they are not all replicated in each development. So how how is that kind of like decided? Um, well, our resident services th does put out a newsletter every single month, and again, I encourage everyone to go on our website. That newsletter outlines all of the activities that are taking place across our portfolio and the online programs, financial literacy, et cetera, programs as well. Um, and then our resident services counselors do a lot of outreach. Um, they send out blasts, they send out information on where and how um, families can participate in different programs that we have. Gotcha. And then at the pro at the specific properties, of course, there are flyers and information. So if it's a senior nutrition program, um, those those seniors in that particular um, building are aware that that resource is coming to that particular yeah. site. And I know a lot of times third parties are interested in doing certain things for certain targeted populations, like especially seniors. Yes. Or disabled or whatever it may be. So you'll find churches or other nonprofits that want to but many of them want to go to a specific property, you know, so and that's understandable. Yeah. But, uh, but again, I just want to acknowledge the fact that there are a plethora of really strong programs being administered throughout the commissions. Thank you. Uh, Thank any you. other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Do you have any update for us on the resident advisory committee? The resident advisory committee, I know um, the last update that I provided is that we were getting geared up for an election process. We're still undergoing that um, those next steps, entering into the contract with the third party monitor to help us facilitate that, setting up the electronic system that will allow us to um, um, have residents participate and vote um, remotely. Um, and we'll be providing a timeline in regards to when we'll be launching and all of the communication materials around that will occur in the next few months prior to our stakeholder engagement um, activities so that we will have the RAB um, set before we engage in the summer um, with the full stakeholder engagement connected to strategic planning. So do, do you have a, an expected timeline for the new board's first meeting or when would they be able to first convene? I would have to get back to you on that, Commissioner Merkowitz. Um, and if if I'm able to do so before the close of today's meeting, I will circle back. If not, I will definitely um, send an email out to all of the commissioners. Um, there's a timeline that's proposed, but it also is contingent on us setting up the electronic system, getting the information out, and ensuring that we're able to really have a robust um, outreach effort so that we get as much participation as possible. So I would assume we have not already set the first date for the meeting, except but we should have an anticipated time right. frame in which the board would be um, set. Commissioner right. Workowitz, we do have a standing RAB that's functioning right now. 
we um, they participated in the process for the uh, public house um, public housing uh, the um, public housing um, and, and admin plan yes and they gave their consent to the changes that were being made to the public housing plan so it's not like we don't have okay. a resident I was, I was a little confused uh, Commissioner Crew mentioned that to, something about that to me before the meeting as well, but I guess I, you know, I'm also anxious for the full board to, you know, we used to get uh, regular updates right. from right. residents. No uh, case so. someone would come and sit in on our meetings every month. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I wasn't here for all of that. I was here for, I guess, a brief window when they were presenting on Zoom. Yes, uh, but it's been over a year. I'm sure since we've benefited from uh well, I, from the I would have to be on the committee too. Yeah. I mean being a resident, so I have to be on the committee too. So yeah. I'll find out what we think. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. I just Thank had you, a comment. Um I think there's frequently a question as to counting money that <clears throat> and our being a county agency. And I think it's noteworthy that the amount that is going to be in the operating county government's operating budget for HOC is the number that you Eight gave. Million. But I would bet it's less than 2% of our agency's operating budget. And I think it's important for people to understand that the bulk of our resources are not coming from the county government. So I thought that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I want to thank you for the report. And also on behalf of the commission, I want to thank you for these little monitors we have in front of us. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so amazing to me how you can overlook things. You know, I walk in, I'm looking for the big monitor out there. And here it is right here in front of me, broken yeah. down. So he took the big monitor and made seven little pieces. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the next item on the agenda is, in fact, the approval of the minutes. These are the approval of the minutes for March the 8th, uh, 2000, and also our closed session on March the 8th. Can I get a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Probably moved and seconded. Are there any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed is nay. Google. The next we'll now go into our committee reports and recommendations, and we'll start with our administrative and regulatory committee, chaired by Commissioner Kelleher. Thank you very much. The administrative and regulatory committee met earlier this month. Well, actually, the end of last month. We've changed months here. And um, we considered two options or two items that were brought to us by the staff. The first was a recommendation to update our procurement policy purchasing limits for micro purchases, which had been at $5,000. And uh, it is the federal recommendation at this point that it be $10,000. We've heard of a lot of issues around inflation and our costs going up, particularly in terms of construction and renovation costs. And so this was brought forward to us um, to recommend that we change our purchasing policy to increase the limit. And is, Chelsea, is there anyone that wants to go further into that? Well, Commissioner uh, Kelleher, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for that introduction. Um, this particular item is one that will be presented by um, Tim Gettinger, our acting CFO. Um, but as you mentioned, Commissioner Kelleher, it really is um, to get in alignment with the federal procurement policy, which was actually changed a couple of years ago, and to allow us to have um, more flexibility as we have determined that the costs have gone over um, our, our current threshold in regards to micro purchases only. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Getzinger. Thank you, Executive Director Andrews, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Kelleher. For the record, my name is Tim Getzinger. I am the Chief Development Funds Officer as well as the Acting CFO. I think that Commissioner Kelleher did an extremely good job at just summarizing where we are. Uh, the current HOC uh, procurement policy was adopted June 7th, 2017. 
Um, and, and in it, it uh, adopted certain limits for micro purchases, which is defined at $5,000 maximum. Uh, however, I do want to note that uh, Davis Bacon related uh, items are they're capped at two thousand dollars, and that will not change uh, with what is being recommended here. Uh, in June twentieth, two thousand and eighteen, the federal OMB raised the federal limit to ten thousand dollars, and then it, on March twelfth, two thousand and nineteen, uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development said that PHAs, public housing agencies, authorities like HOC could adopt it. Uh, the, the $10,000 limit. However, we would need to uh, formally go and have it um, our procurement policy amended. So that's exactly uh, what we are trying to do. Again, the real reason is inflation. Uh, you've seen it in grocery stores. Eggs used to cost $4. Now they cost, I don't know, 40 um, <laughs> But everything is uh, very expensive. We did provide um, a lot of details to the Administrative and Reg Regulatory Committee on March 20th. 2023, and uh, they do um, also support staff's recommendation to increase the micro purchase limits to $10,000, but again, keeping the Davis Bacon related purchases at $10,000. Uh, and with that, if there are any questions, I'd like, I'd be happy to address them. Any questions? Committee recommended this to the committee to be approved, right? Yes. And uh, if there are are no questions, then I would move that we adopt resolution 23 19. And we have a second. I and Poppy moved and seconded to approve resolution 23 19. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed uh -huh. nay. So ordered. Okay. So, thank you. The second item that the committee um, reviewed and considered was the annual public housing agency plan that staff has prepared for submission to housing and urban development. This is an annual process of requirement because we do receive about 90% of our funding from HUD and we have um, a requirement to submit an annual public housing agency plan. We went over the plan changes and had the opportunity to question staff about the various changes, most of which um, were really more technical in nature than anything else as HUD and our agency has moved largely out of what was technically called public housing through the RADS program and now uh, are working with RADS program and the voucher program primarily which is all provided into the, in the plan. Um, I would be happy, Chelsea, if you have anyone that would like to provide. Yes, and I do that. just want to indicate Commissioner Croom's request for the letter from our RAB is included in this packet as well. Um, they did provide support. I will turn it over to our compliance team and allow um, Elliot Rule, um, our compliance um analysts to provide an overview of a high level very quick overview of this recommendation thank you good afternoon commissioners uh, for the record my name is elliot rule i'm a management compliance analyst with hcc's compliance division i'm here to address uh the submission of hcc's fiscal year 2024 annual public housing agency plan the fiscal year 2024 pha plan serves as an update to the required five-year plan which covers the period of fiscal year 2020 to 2024. This item was reviewed and endorsed at the Administrative and Regulatory Committee on March 20th, 2023. Staff released a draft of the fiscal year 2024 PHA plan to the public on February 16th, 2023, and the public comment period culminated with a public hearing on April 3rd, 2023. To date, HOC has not received any comments for review. I'm glad to answer any questions you might have about the fiscal year 2024 public housing agency plan. Any questions about the content? In terms of further process, the resident advisory board that did then meet and endorse the changes as well. And on this past Monday, we held a public hearing, um, which allowed anyone from the public to attend and ask questions about the plan. We did have one attendee from the public who chose not to uh, speak or ask any questions. But we have completed all of the requirements. And uh, as such, I would uh, move that we approve resolution 2320 to 
authorize staff to submit the annual public housing agency plan to the Housing and Urban Development Agency. So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve Resolution 23-20. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Hold this nay. So ordered just to make a note that the state of Maryland also just approved their five-year PHA plan. So uh, <laughs> the next committee is Development and Finance Committee chaired by Commissioner Snyder. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yep. Uh, this is um, before us at the moment uh, is the approval of the new lender to participate in our single family uh, mortgage purchase program. And um, Andrews, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair of the um, DevFin committee. This particular item was presented to the DevFin committee and in, involved um, some extensive Q&A around how the program would be administered and the pros and cons of increasing limits, uh, income limits, as well as purchase price of um, properties. Um, we are going to address those questions and seek support of the full commission today. I will turn it over to Monty Stanford, our Director of Mortgage Finance, along with um, Jennifer Washington, the Assistant um, Director of Bond Finance, um, to answer and to provide an overview of this uh, recommendation. Thank you, Executive Director Andrews. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Today, I want to talk about HOC single family programs and give a kind of preamble uh, to what uh, Ms. Washington will be discussing with you. Uh, HOC, as you know, HOC single family programs provide FHA financing as well as conventional financing through both the GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We also administer down payment assistance and closing cost assistance as well as oversee HLC's single family portfolio of home whole loans, which are approximately 500 first mortgages and over 500 uh, uh, down payment assistance loans. Today, the Mortgage Finance Division will presenting on three items uh, that are important to the operation of HLC single family programs. The first, as Commissioner Simon mentioned, is the approval of a new participating single family lender. HOC currently has a stable of 24 active participating lenders and recognizes that increasing lender participation can broaden HOC's ex exposure to HOC's mortgage products, as well as clothing cost assistance programs that can only be used in conjunction with an, M um, an MPP first mortgage. The second item, is the approval of, to select a single family mortgage loan subservice in which we will highlight the process followed to ensure our whole loan portfolio continues to be serviced by a responsive and high caliber servicer. And the third item is the approval to increase the maximum sale price and income limits for the single family mortgage purchase program as determined in 2022 by the Internal Revenue Service and HUD respectively. At this time, I'll turn it over to Ms. Washington. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Jennifer Washington, Assistant Director of Bond Management. And I believe our first item is of the new lender item. Uh, the Commission has approved continuous lender solicitation and participation in the single family mortgage purchase program. The criteria to become a new lender are as follows. The lender is not a mortgage broker and can close loans in its own name. The lender is approved to do business with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, or is an approved FHA originating lender. And the lender is approved to do business with U.S. Bank, HOC's master servicer. Limited Homes Loans has applied for participation in HOC's mortgage purchase program and meets all the requirements. Um, and because of time, uh, the Development and Finance Committee considered this item at its meeting on March 23rd and supports staff recommendation to approve this new lender, and we are requesting your approval. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. 
Are there any questions? Hearing none, uh, on behalf of the committee, I would recommend approval. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded yes. to approve. Resolution 23-21. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. So ordered. Um, key roll. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, for the record, Jennifer uh, Washington, Assistant Director of Bond Management. And your next item is a request to approve and select a um, single family mortgage loan subservicer in accordance with RFP 2344. You have before your request to approve Dover Mule Mortgage Inc. as the commission single family mortgage loan subservicer. The mortgage purchase program includes a small portfolio of whole loans that are serviced by either the original lender or the commissioner's current sub lender, sub servicer, which is Dover Mule. These whole loans were originated prior to 2012 when the program implemented the, of the existing mortgage backed securities structure. The RFP for services was issued on July 25th, 2022, and after no responses were received, we reissued it again in September 19th, 2022, with responses due on October 17th. Three responses were received, and it was determined that only two, Dovin Mill and Novad Management Consulting, satisfied compliance with and met all minimum qualifications of the RFP, as shown on page 86. Um, page 87, I'm sorry, I wasn't referencing page numbers. Page 87, the evaluation team, which included staff from mortgage finance and finance divisions, evaluated and scored the responses based upon the evaluation criteria. Out of 100 points, page 90, please, Dovin Mule received the highest score. No, that's pricing is estimated to be 83% higher than Dovin Mule based upon staff analysis. Uh, the, the evaluation team considered the existing loan portfolio and applied both respondents' proposed pricing to a typical monthly servicing at typical monthly servicing activity as seen by the portfolio. Therefore, staff recommends with the support of the Development and Finance Committee approval of Dove and Mule as the Commission's single family mortgage loan subservicer. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? If not, on behalf of the committee, I would recommend um, and move the selection of Dove and Mule as our um, I'll move service service. Second. 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 It's been properly moved and seconded to approve resolution 23 22. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed is nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item. The next item is. Um, the opportunity to increase the sales price and income limits for a single family mortgage purchase program. Yes. For the record, Jennifer Washington, Assistant Director of Bond Management. The single family mortgage purchase program follows IRS regulations, which guides the maximum sales price and income limits for the program. And today you have a request proposing to increase both maximum limits. Because the mortgage purchase program is a continuously continuous lending program, Increase, increasing the maximum sales price and income limits will not exclude the affordable incomes from access to the program. Each of our lenders underwrites for FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Freddie Mac, along with overlays from U.S. Bank. We review every loan that gets approved for pre-closing compliance, along with the fact that no loans go to closing without HOC's approval. In fiscal year 2022, the average sales price for the program was 278529 and the average household income was 76091 for a three-person household, which is 59% of the area median income. Since our meeting with the Development and Finance Committee, we now show on page 96 that in fiscal year 2022, for each household size, program participants, participants are purchasing affordably priced homes and are borrowers within the 36 to 75% of the area median income, which is and has been the history of the program. Increasing these limits, however, will continue to broaden our reach of households that include millennials, entry-level professionals, 
civil servants, single earners with children, and multi-generations, all of which may have substantial savings, all which may not have substantial savings, who look to the program for much needed closing cost assistance that the program provides. This has the added benefit of diversifying home ownership across the county for first time home buyers. Page 98. With the 2022 IRS average area sales price now at 896, 896,000 for our high cost area, the program is able to increase its maximum sales price limit to 806,598. The program's maximum loan amount will be 726 due to the change in the 2023 Federal Housing Finance Agency maximum mortgage limits. With respect to income limits on page 100, IRS regulations allow for high cost areas to set limits for a one to two person household as high as 120% of the area median income, and for a three person household as high as 140%. Utilizing the 2022 area median income of 142,300, for a four person household and adjusting for the high cost area, staff recommends increasing the maximum income limits for the program as follows. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. There was questions? considerable discussion in the committee on this. And there were two questions that I had um, that I wanted to be sure um, we talked about. Obviously, just because the limits are high, we've had limits that have exceeded. The average loans are significantly less, and there are still properties that are affordable to some families yet, yeah, at least. Um, but the market has been very difficult recently, particularly for them. Uh, I know that we have not historically done VA loans. CDA now does VA loans. Is this something that we should be moving into within our mortgage purchase program as well? We can. Yes, that's something that, that we can look into. Yes. It would can. seem to me it would be very useful from the benefit of our lenders to know that we can expand to the veterans now. I don't remember what the reason is that they were precluded in the past, but um, if, if we would be eligible, I would hope that the staff would ignore that and bring that to the committee. Yes, um, the benefit of, of VA loans is they don't require any money down or a, right. a smaller down payment and the the loan, cost money would go farther. Correct. And the loan limits are, are comparable to FHA. Yeah. So that would be uh, a big help. And it would be useful to let the realtors know that we're exploring that expansion as well when we meet with them. Um, are there questions from our fellow commissioners? Particular. Thank you. I have a question, um, both page 95 and 100 of the briefing book mentioned that this is essentially moving into moderate income from what we have traditionally served in as low income, which is a, a kind of mission expansion or strategy of, of uh, expanding our service line. I'm wondering why is there some reason we're taking this up now independently of our strategic planning where we would look at how we uh serving our community what areas may need more attention or less attention um what resources we have or don't have in order to serve various uh extenuations of the population because essentially the same argument could be made for any of our programs why don't we serve the middle class as well as those that are low income or very low income and with thirty-seven thousand, i know it's a different source of money a different program but with thirty-seven thousand people on our waiting list uh, uh, i'm curious as to why we're trying to do this now independent of strategic planning um i guess commissioner keller i, I would just note that I think all we're doing is updating the income limits to conform with what we're allowed to. They were already, we were already in this space. 
um, at, you know, it's with 120% and 140%. Uh, so this isn't this isn't an expansion of the program. It's just you know as we do with other items where we update the the limits this is what we're doing here. And I guess I would I mean I think there are lots of things we should uh, discuss in the strategic plan. Um, but it's I, I also wouldn't say that it's unique that we're serving moderate income uh, individuals with our programs are. Our developments are multi, uh, are mixed income, and so you know we are serving both low income and higher incomes there. So I don't think I don't see this as significantly different than that. Um, is there some reason this needs to be decided now versus within the strategic planning context? Um, I, I would just also add um, to provide additional context to what um, Commissioner Merkowitz indicated is that um, both Fannie and Freddie, as well as the state, um, review and update their limits on an ongoing basis. So we're keeping track with those other, um, of course, best practices in terms of thinking about our program and who we're offering it to. Um, and so that's another rationale for uh, what we always do in terms of looking at how can we make sure that we're remaining competitive? How can we make sure that we're serving um, similar populations as both the state, the federal, and um, Fannie and Freddie mm -hmm. are offering as well? Does anyone want to answer my question? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll uh, try to answer your question, Commissioner Kelleher. I think. Uh, it's important to appreciate that, you know, the two entities that once providing, you know, us information on uh, housing sales prices and another on income limits. And if you acknowledge the housing uh, sell uh, price limit and you don't acknowledge the income limit, we are actually crowding out potential borrowers from benefiting from our program simply because we live in a high cost area. The other uh, counties that are contiguous to us are also high cost areas, so we're we're competitive with them. But then we have counties contiguous to us that are not high cost areas where we could drive potential borrowers to if we don't make the adjustment on the income limit. So uh, as it relates to the strategic plan, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that whole process, but that by the time the strategic plan comes along, mm -hmm. there could be another cycle mm -hmm. of increases on both sides, given the latent effect of these increases due to COVID and both the IRS and HUD's inability to collect data to support the increase. So it's because we have the data now that this is coming up now? Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah, yeah. It's because of the fact that if you look at what's happening in the industry right now, there's a significant change and increase because of a number of factors, interest rates, cost of financing, others that are changing income limits. And HUD, while it makes adjustments on a regular basis about that, our responsibility as users is to try to keep ourselves current with what those current standards are so we're not depriving the opportunity for people to participate in our programs. Yeah. And so that's really the reason why we do it. And so by the time we do strategic planning, uh, we will be probably conflating to other things. I don't think that we, in the strategic plan, we, we are not going to get this granular. Okay, we're not going to get this granular in terms of strategic plan. Well, we aren't going to be selling the $800,000 houses and we're not going to be having purchasers with uh, a loan amount of $700,000. Uh, to me, I agree that it's um those loans would be very few um it certainly will be easier for our lenders to know that our loan limits are consistent with the marketplace yeah. and the maximum loan is what the maximum loan is in every other arena and they won't have to maintain data and information that is separate from uh, because that would become an administrative burden and a banking burden. Um, but I don't think we're going to see our purchasing pool 
proof to that song and tell. And, and I would just add on to what Commissioner Simon is saying is that I totally agree. I mean, historically, we have seen that that's just not who this program is serving. But I, I also think we don't necessarily want to preclude that opportunity mm -hmm. if if there are borrowers who would benefit from our program. Right. And, and, and since it, it comes at no expense to, or, or you know, it, it, it doesn't preclude, it doesn't take away at all from serving, you know, lower income and more moderate income borrowers. Um, so it's just- if, it's, if they can find the properties to buy at right. a lower price, yeah. we're not gonna control that one way yeah. or the other, whether we change these or we don't. I know Rick. I guess the, the question that had come up in the uh, committee, which I don't think has been answered as I read this. How many people have one exceeded the current income limits? Or for that matter, how many people have reached the ceiling in terms of the purchase price max? In other words, what's the real demand for these increases? Yes, I, I, we, we have spoken with our lenders and we do not have that information. We believe it would be a very small number. Well, and I, I will also add that it's difficult to track because if you are over that income, then you're not going to apply. So it would be, and it would be incumbent on these different lenders to keep track of how many people asked about that program but weren't eligible because of income. Um, and so that's why it would be difficult for us mm -hmm. to have that data at any point, um, just to um, be realistic in terms of our capacity to answer that question in the future as well. The reality is if there's a demand for a program and the program limits exclude people, you would be hearing about it from either the lenders or some of the people who were unsuccessful. Uh, I mean, it just seems to me that um, our experience has been that we are considerably under in both terms of income and in terms of purchase price. Uh, and we're increasing it just because we can, which I think you know, optically is not the greatest thing for HOC to be doing. Um, and it just, it goes back a little bit to uh, the comment that Commissioner Kelleher made in terms of mission for HOC, who are we trying to serve? And how do you defend a program that's from HOC that in fact permits people to buy $800,000 over? I think that's a very difficult thing to defend. All right. I think uh, that's a reflection of the area that we live in. I mean, if you look at the actual income limits, you know, we're still, it's, 120, 140 uh, area median income. You know, so we're not talking about high income earners. So we are really conforming standards to industry standards to what we're doing. And in no way are we looking to either deny access to, but in fact provides perhaps an expansion of the number of people who may be looking to use our product. Because in fact, we could serve a high income, but again, everything that we do is subject to our approval. So no lender is going out, getting someone into this program with our, our, our approval. So we, we would know that there's any increased activity, whether for persons who have higher income or paying more money for a mortgage. If, if anything, so we have safeguards around that to make sure that we continue to serve the population we have been serving through this program. And all we're doing is conforming these to industry standards. And that's typically what we have done. It's the same way we conform our things to FHA's fair market events. Every year HUD puts out new fair market events. What do we do? We come in here, present to us, and we look at it and approve it. And this, this is the same type of activity we're being asked to take part in. I, I think this discussion though, goes back to my argument of the banks don't put a um, minimum income, which we have an arbitrary income that to apply for our program, which is lower than um, the industry and precludes people of lower income 
from being served. So I hope that we're going to find a way to eliminate this arbitrary minimum income for application. And I know that our lenders are not happy with it, or some of our lenders are not happy. Um, but I, I don't, I think it's important as much as I don't like the optics of it either. If we're going to be providing mortgages and they're going to be in the marketplace, we need to be operating without setting up contrary standards. And um, these are issued, certainly these numbers were issued back in December, I believe, or announced in December and became available. Um, so we're, loans have been um, being processed at these numbers um, uniformly with the exception of our program. And um, I, I reluctantly uh, support um, being consistent in the marketplace. I, I think we have to be. The only concern, other concern I would have is if these borrowers are consuming closing cost loan programs. Um, and we're not seeing these buyers. We haven't seen these buyers. So I don't think we're going to see them anyway. But I think just for relationships with the finance industry, we need to come into compliance. Can I get a motion? So I move that on the on behalf of the committee um, for those and other reasons that we discussed in the committee. A second. It has been properly moved and seconded to approve resolution 22, no, 23, 23, 23, 23, 23, 23, like that. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Attention. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. David Hillendale. Mm -hmm. I've changed my driving route to make sure I drive past New Hampshire Avenue more than I was doing before. Just <laughs> look at what's going on with Hillendale. <laughs> well, now, um, our next item on the agenda is Elizabeth House and uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, so long ago, most people. Um, Ms. Andrews, do you want to go ahead and um, Turn this over, we're looking to select the construction materials testing and third party inspection services. Yes. Commissioner Simon and commissioners, we're really excited that this project is continuing to move along in the right direction. And so I'll turn it over to Catherine Hollister, our housing acquisition manager, to provide a brief overview of the request before you today. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is Catherine Hollister, housing acquisition manager in the real estate division. Today, staff is requesting the commission's authorization to negotiate and execute a contract with Hills Farms Engineering Services for construction materials testing and third-party inspection services for Hillendale Gateway and to approve a third-party testing budget. Pages 107 through 109 of your brief book provide an overview of Hillendale Gateway, including the executive summary for this item. In short, Hillendale Gateway will be a new mixed-use, mixed-income, multi-generational community that will include a total of 463 residential units. Hillendale Gateway is a hallmark development that will be a catalyst for economic development in the East County and will set new benchmarks for sustainable and resilient multifamily development. Pages 110 through 113 provide information on the procurement process, the scope of services sought, and the evaluation and selection process for Hillendale Gateway's third-party testing consultant. In summary, HOC issued a request for proposal for third-party testing services in accordance with HOC's procurement policy. HOC received two responsive proposals, one from Hillis Carnes Engineering Services and the other from Kim Engineering. Proposals were scored on five evaluation criteria, experience, management plan, price, methodology, and MFD participation with a maximum possible score of 100 points. 
Hillis Carnes received the highest overall score of 87 out of 100 possible points, receiving the top score in four out of the five evaluation criteria. And finally, Hillis Carnes submitted the lowest price, which was 3% lower than the bid provided by Kim Engineering. On page 115 of your brief book, staff recommends the selection of Hillis Carnes to provide third party testing services an authorization for the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Hills Carnes in an amount up to $489,430. In addition, staff recommends a total third party testing budget of $562,845, which includes a commission held contingency of 15%. Staff recommends this contingency, contingency amount based on its previous engagements with third party testing consultants and to cover any unforeseen or additional services required. The resolution for this item can be found on page 116 of your brief book. Thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. If there are no questions, I would need approval of Hills, Hills Carnes as our uh, third party tester for um, Illinois Gateway. This, this, this particular resolution has two actions, though. It's not only is it the selection of the tester, but also the second item you had on here, I forgot what it was now. The budget inspection. The budget court, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you, you're, looking, you're seconding both parts of that, correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. we probably move the second to approve resolution 22. 23-24, I'm moving the year back. Um, any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All this nay. So ordered, thank you very much. Um, just a, a quick note. Um, it, I didn't want to bring it up before we voted, but since we're on it, because I realized this was about construction materials testing and not about the construction materials themselves, but I just wanted to... Uh, you know, I had shared an article about uh, mm -hmm. clean cement technologies, um, and uh, you know, since this would be a project uh, built with cement, uh, I think it would be great for us to explore those opportunities. And I, I know we, um, I shared that article uh, amongst commissioners, but I wanted to just share that publicly that uh, that's something I think is worthwhile exploring uh, to take advantage of, and and broadly. Uh, for all of our projects that use cement, but I mean, I think it clearly fits very well into, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with Hillendale with the passive house. Absolutely, yeah. we can share it with staff. We're looking into it, and thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. Yeah. Very helpful. Yes. Next item. Um, the next item is the is approval to select Bird Corporation as the demolition contractor for Elizabeth House Apartments in accordance with the bid um, number 2361 and to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute contract for that demolition. Thank you, Commissioner Simon. Um, this um, particular matter is a request to move forward with this um, vendor to do the demolition, but I also want to acknowledge the support that we've received from the county as it pertains to funding the demolition of Elizabeth House, which is also reflected in this proposal. I will turn it over to our real estate team, um, Gio, uh, to provide an overview of what is being submitted. Thank you, Executive Director. Um, on the record, my name is Gil Kavaladze. I'm a senior financial analyst at the Real Estate Division. And as the Executive Director mentioned, this is a request to approve the selection of um, a contractor to demolish um, Elizabeth House Apartments, the existing senior public housing property, 160-unit property uh, that's located next to the Leggett, the new development. Um, the Elizabeth House apartments are in the process of being vacated and should be 100% um, vacant in the next few weeks. Um, and it's reached its useful, uh, the end of the useful life and uh, needs to be demolished and uh, to facilitate the redevelopment, future redevelopment of that site. Um, HOC um, issued an IFB um, invitation for a bid um, in February to solicit proposals for demolition contract. We received three uh, proposals. Um, 
the lowest bidder, the Berg, Corp Berg Corporation, uh, proposed a budget of approximately $2.3 million and um, was the lowest bidder, as I mentioned. So we request approval for the Berg Corporation to be selected for the contract. Um, we also propose and request uh, approval for a uh, contingency of 20% of this amount uh, for any unforeseen um, circumstances, and that would be approximately $460,000. And um, the two amounts would bring the total requested budget to $2.75 million. Um, uh, proposed funding for this demolition um, has three sources. Um, county CIP funds of $1.5 million have already been approved and should be available to HOC um, uh, by the time the demolition starts in late May or June of this year. Um, there's also a proposed uh, DHCA interest-free loan of $1 million that hasn't been yet approved, but we hope to receive that funding um, in the process or during the process of the demolition. And the remaining amount, if needed, um, we request um, uh, approval to um, for up to $500,000 to be extended from HOC's Opportunity Housing Reserve Fund. Um, as I mentioned, the CIP funding has already been approved, uh, but we we are requesting a bridge funding for the DHCA loan of one up to one and a half, up to one million dollars from HOC's PNC real estate line of credit. Uh, we expect to complete the uh, permitting and um, contract neg negotiation process by uh, May, and um, hopefully start the demolition process in late May or sometime in June that would allow us to uh, finish the demolition by the end of the year. Um, there are two resolutions for this request. One is for the approval and one is for the relock authorization. And just a slight correction, the uh, the commission packet and the first resolution mentioned two and a half million dollar um, relock authorization. Uh, that's from our previous request to the development finance committee. Um, we At that time, we, we weren't sure if the CIP funding would also be available I uh, started the demolition, so we included that in the bridge request. But since then, we've confirmed that that funding will actually be available. So we don't need to, we don't need two and a half million dollars of bridge funding. We only need one million dollars, and so the resolution that's attached to the packet will be corrected to reflect that. The second resolution already reflects the correction. Yeah. Is it resolution twenty three twenty five A or B that? We need to have corrected. 25A uh, needs to be corrected. Um, can I ask one question? Excuse me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I ask one question? Um, you said that uh, you want to start it at, in May for the demolition. Is it anyone still at Elizabeth House right now? Currently, there are still remaining tenants, but we're in the process of relocating them to the new Leggett and other They'll be relocated before of course, the yes. demolition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in my past background, we did undertake a demolition and the place was occupied. Oh, right. And when the claw came down on the building, it came down an area where the resident was taking a bath. Oh, wow. Okay, and so that cost us a lot of money. I <laughs> the, 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 the trauma cost us more than the demolition. <laughs> oh, my. So we were we were going to avoid that problem. Mm. If, if there are no other questions, I um, move approval of resolution 2325A. Um, in the selection of the contractor and resolution 2325B, approval of up to $1 million in the PNC Bank real estate line of credit to demolish uh, Elizabeth House apartments. Second. Then probably move the second to approve resolution 2325A and 2325B. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Call this nay. So ordered. Thank you. I truly hope that the contractor is going to be doing, in most cases in demolition, they do it, time is after photography so that they can track this whole thing because of liability potential issues that go on. So uh, this is going to be a very interesting demolition. Well, they were doing the construction at least at one point in time, they were filming the court. Uh, are they still doing that? 
Uh, for the record, uh, Marcus Urban, Director of Real Estate. Um, the live camera, I believe, is still up, um, but we'll explore either pivoting, pivoting that one um, to capture the demolition well, as it occurs. It be an interesting um, time lapse. Yeah. Yes, time lapse <laughs> with one going up and the other one coming down. Um, you should have some wonderful time editing notes. <laughs> Lots of fun. Yeah. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we've now finished all of the items for the committee. Development the finance committee. We have no other committee uh, items coming before you. We do now go into the next part of the agenda, which is items requiring deliberation and or action. And the first item that's coming before us relates to resolution 2326 related to strategic plan consultant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're really excited to come before the commission today and take this first step towards the process of reevaluating our strategic plan for the next five years. As um, you commissioners know, we created a task force internally with our staff to lead this process for uh, the staff purposes, but we'll be working hand in hand with leadership from the board in regards to our strategic plan and our, our next steps. Um, the task force includes our Deputy Executive Director, Kareen Brown, Ken Silverman, our Director of Government Affairs, and Tia Blunt, our Director of Public Affairs and Communications, and of course will be supported by all the staff and directors um, throughout the agency. Um, I will turn it over to Kareen Brown, who will um, begin the discussion today in regards to our recommendation. Thank you. Um... Director Director Andrews, good afternoon, commissioners, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Kareen Brown, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director. Um, my colleagues, uh, Ken Silverman, Director of Government Affairs, and Tia Blount, Director of Public Affairs and Communications, are pleased to present to you a recommendation for a consultant that will serve um, as to develop the new strategic plan covering uh, the period of the next five years for HSC. Um, as you're aware, um, the last strategic plan covered FY fiscal year of 2018 to 2022. And um, HSC has undergone a period of transition in leadership, but we're ready to undertake the development of a new plan. Um, please go to, um, I guess, slide number three of the actual presentation. Thank you. So the next several um, pages, next three pages, I'll just review some of the highlights of the um, executive summary. So um, there has been quite a bit of conversation around the strategic plan. You know, when will it start? What will it entail? And things of that nature. But um, one thing has been clear to us as we develop the RFP or the request for proposal for consultants, and as we evaluated the proposals that we received, we felt that this is this strategic plan for the next five years is not your typical strategic plan. Uh, for the first part, um, I've been here for a little while, and we've <laughs> we've always used um, a facilitator to develop a strategic plan. And while um, it's yielded some really good results that have been actionable, and um, we've achieved some phenomenal things over the last several years, um, we've been operating you know, in a changed environment where diversity, equity, and inclusion matters now more than ever. Um, we've been faced with climate changes, and um, we've had to make, this, make decisions around um, those, those issues. Resources are scarce. Um, we know for sure that change is constant. In fact, it's the only constant that we're, we're um, aware of. And um, HSC's need to rebrand itself, refresh its mission. In fact, I reviewed our re mission statement um, recently. And um, based on all the things we've accomplished um, in the last 10, 15 years, it needs a little bit of tweaking, I'd say. Um, and so um, as we've been you know, working on this, the plan and this evaluation of the um, firms that we would consider to take us into the next five years and beyond, um, we we've, we've felt deeply among our, um, the team that's been evaluating it that while it's important, it's, it will be an important plan for the next five years, it's really laying the foundation for our future. 
And so um, we, we felt that it requires a different kind of um, firm or consultant that will move us into the future. The, the kind of expertise that we're looking for will be different. The qualifications will be different and the process will be different. And so, um, you know, we, we've been really considering deeply, well, who should we select for um, the firm that will represent us? Um, just very quickly uh, and included in the, um, in the executive summary, we, in the proposal, in the RFP that we put out, we asked for a few uh, key elements, the, an evaluative report that would cover HOC's history, its funding history, and the operating environment. We asked the um, respondents to, you know, provide us with general public, general information of how we interact with the public, um, our staff, our customers. We asked them to highlight for us in, in that evaluative report um, HOC strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, um, as you might imagine in a strategic plan, to highlight for us our priorities. We know what our priorities are. We, we do know what our priorities are, but we wanted them to include that as well, just to make sure they understand who we are and what we're expecting from them. Um, we wanted them to also highlight structure or staffing or resources, um, cost or cost associated with providing services and our functions, and um, recommendations related to the resources and requirements for our staffing. Um, as part of their process, they are also required to provide us with, to develop the plan, not just to give us an evaluative report about HOC, but to develop the plan, to disseminate the plan, to provide um, uh, presentations of how they uh, will interact with our stakeholders and uh, give us feedback. And by the us, I mean the board. This is not just about staff working with the um, consultant to provide a, a strategic plan. And, um, and and once the plan is done to provide it to us and to, to, to include a plan for disseminating it to the stakeholders, to the public, to the board, to staff, and, um, and ultimately to create an implementation plan for us. Um, if you could just go to slide four, uh, we received on, on or about, I think it was January 9th, we published a request for proposal and received responses from four firms. So we did not establish uh, elimination criteria in the, in the RFP. And so we reviewed the proposals received from the five firms and uh, their steady state, their uh, recent relocated to Montgomery County, HCI, um, which is headquarters in, in Washington, DC, Public Works, which is uh, located in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and Oryx, um, I believe they're local, but they came together, a group of um, various um, localities to um, present a proposal to us, and Prim Corp, who was located in Arlington, Virginia. So those five firms were, they met, the, they provided in the proposal all the requirements that we were looking for, and so we, we set out to um, review their, um, their offer, and um, and, and to determine who was best suited to represent the commission on this adventure. Um, the evaluation criteria, if you could just jump to slide number six on the, on the uh, PowerPoint presentation, um, included the methodology. We were very much interested in innovative approaches to how they would um, complete the assignment and, um, and to determine if they were the best fit for the agency. We're looking for creative ways for um, approaching uh, developing this plan, uh, making the process um, engaging, uh, less burdensome, and to, to have as much input from our stakeholders as possible. We um, were looking for their experience, um, not just of the firm, but of the, um, the, their staff, the team members that would be working on the strategic plan. We wanted to ensure that the offerers had the capacity to complete the work, not just to start it, but could they finish it um, and finish it timely. Um, we were also interested in, in their fees, for, both for the development of the plan as well as for implementation of the plan. And um, as the commission is uh, focused on minority participation, we wanted to ensure that um, not just in, in, in the team, but just in their business approach to um, uh, engaging in, in minorities in their firm, particularly in, in professional capacity. And so um, 
so those were the, um, the, the things we required in, in their written proposals. We also um, included the, the possibility of bringing the firms in for oral presentations. And so we extended that to, um, to all firms and uh, four of the five firms um, responded and participated in oral presentations. And so um, for, the, for the, um, the evaluation criteria, there was a maximum of 100 points and they were, firms were evaluated on those, on those, um, on those criteria. We've included in, in, the, um, in, the, in the packet, and I, I guess I should have jumped to that, and we've included in the packet a summary of all the firms in, on slide seven to 11. I hope you've had an opportunity to review them. We've, um, I'll spare you from having to go through all the, um, the particulars of the firm, but um, if you have any questions on that, we can, we can try to answer them um, at the end or if you so desire to ask them now. But if not, um, I want to um, turn it over to um, Ken Silverman, who will um, talk you through um, the scores and the timeline and um, just a conclusion that we reached. And um, I'll jump back in and, and, and um, summarize the recommendation and what we're asking you to approve this evening. So Ken, please. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Ken Silverman, HOC's Director of Government Affairs. Uh, if you could jump ahead to slide 12. Um, so as Karen said, the evaluation team was uh, composed of myself, Deputy Director Brown, and Director of Communications Tia Blunt. Um, uh, Executive Director Andrews participated as an observer. Um, the table on this slide shows the averages of our individual scoring. Uh, there were some differences between us, but each of us found that Public Works uh, received the highest score. Uh, we used a standardized method to award points for fees and minority participation. Um, so only one respondent was certified as an MFD-owned business and received the full 15 points, uh, and the others were awarded points based on their reported composition of their assembled uh, project teams. Um, and because the proposals uh, had quite a range of both uh, total cost as well as the amount of hours that were uh, proposed uh, among the teams. So we normalized that by uh, awarding points for fees based on their proposed hourly rate. Um, and you can see that reflected there. Um, overall, in the methodology, capacity, and uh, experience categories, we were far and away most impressed by public works. Um, and uh, Prim Corp uh, did the best uh, in their uh, minority participation, but did not respond to our request for an interview. Uh, they were the only one of the five firms that did not, and that gave us doubts about their capacity and uh, left us with a number of unanswered questions about uh, their methodology and their proposal. Um, we were particularly impressed by the depth and the breadth of the knowledge available on the Public Works team. Um, they were proposing to have a team with 10 members, um, which gave us confidence that they uh, could achieve the really uh, substantive and far-reaching plan that uh, we're seeking uh, within a reasonable time frame. Um, among those uh, team members was a PhD statistician uh, that we felt confident could help us uh, to make the most of the data that HOC uh, owns, um, a, a housing policy expert, as well as, uh, although they are located in Pennsylvania, they included a subcontractor uh, who has specific knowledge about Montgomery County's uh, government ecosystem um, and can help to uh, ensure that the, um, the plan is well-grounded um, their proposal, uh, we felt, went the furthest in responding in a detailed way to HOC's specific needs, um, and while well, other proposals uh, relied greatly on examples from past engagements or kind of general concepts. Um, and although the overall cost was on the higher side among the proposals, um, we felt the hourly rate was reasonable and that uh, we needed the larger team and the larger number of hours proposed uh, in order to accomplish um, both the uh, level of, of public engagement that we're seeking in this plan, 
uh, as well as the, the deep dive um, policy-wise. Um, if you can go to slide 13. <clears throat> so this slide shows, uh, it takes a graphic from a public works proposal to show their proposed uh, schedule, as well as kind of a, a little bit of a, a snapshot of their methodology. Um, you can see for public engagement, um, they proposed a combination of individual interviews, uh, broad surveys of different uh, stakeholder groups, um, small focus groups, uh, as well as a series of large town halls, uh, both for, for HOC staff, but more importantly for HOC residents and for the, the public. Um, and they used, uh, they proposed a combination of, of virtual, you know, electronic as well as in-person uh, means to try to get uh, participation from as many people as possible. Um, the schedule, uh, we do expect this schedule probably to slide uh, two to four weeks as far as the start date. Uh, if the commission does approve this recommendation today, then we would still need to negotiate a contract. Um, we do think there may be opportunities to achieve some additional cost savings. So the, the cost proposed would really be a maximum. And then, um, you know, we could work with them to potentially, uh, for example, they, they propose 62 individual interviews. Uh, it may be possible that we can negotiate to, to bring that down and that would uh, reduce the cost. Um, and uh, we are, you know, just one thing I wanted to note, uh, definitely keenly aware that, uh, you know, public engagement activities are more difficult in, you know, late July, August, uh, as people are out of town. So mm -hmm. we definitely would be working with the consultant and very sensitive to ensuring that, um, you know, any, anything that we're doing to try to engage the public is at a time that we're likely to get the maximum possible response. Um, if you can go to, to slide 14. Uh, so this kind of just summarizes, again, the uh, factors that led our team to uh, score the way that we did. Um, and uh, we felt that Public Works had uh, the best combination of experience and expertise to be able to deliver innovation, uh, both in the methodology of the plan development um, and in the public engagement process, but also in the ultimate recommendations that are delivered to the Commission. Um, we also felt that Public Works uh, had demonstrated the most local knowledge um, and were competitive in minority participation and, and price. And so um, there are really two issues, two main issues that we're asking the Commission to consider. And um, the first is the selection of um, Public Works as a consultant to develop HSC's strategic plan for the next five years. And um, the approval uh, to enter in for the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Public Works for uh, 300 up to 361,500, as well as to approve a 10% contingency, which will be an agency held contingency, thereby bringing the total budget for completion to uh, 397,650. And um, with respect to fiscal or budget impact, um, there's no direct fiscal impact, um, broadly speaking. Uh, the FY23, because we're expecting this to commence in FY23, we, there had been 200,000 budgeted in the FY23 budget. And um, we will be recommending and hopefully approve, the commission will approve um, 200,000 more in the FY24 budget, which would cover the um, entire amount that we're proposing. And um, we're asking, again, the commission's approval of this um, request, and we'd be happy to take your questions this time. Commissioners, I do also want to add that we, of course, um, put out this RFP with the request that respondents address how they would approach the strategic plan as well as the implementation uh, plan. 
at this time, we're coming before you seeking approval to move forward with the strategic plan and reserve the right to come back to the board upon approval that they've done a successful job with the strategic plan to proceed with the next phase, which would be implementation. So we're not seeking the implementation phase at this time. Obviously, we want an opportunity to confirm that they um, have met our satisfaction as it pertains to the strategic plan before entering into the second part of what would be the next phase of this process. Questions? Well, one question I have, remembering the last time we went through this process, and the voluminous material that we produced in terms of data, they're going to spend two weeks on document and data research. Is that the time period in which they sort of analyze the, uh, the environment in which we're operating and, and get all the statistics? How? I mean, my real question is, how do they get all of that data and who puts it together? Commissioners, I will indicate that these proposals were based on their best estimates in terms of what and how um, the timeline would work. It will, of course, be modified based on initial meetings with staff and um, initial meetings with the commissioners on the proposed timeline, what's reasonable. But uh, um, we are, as staff, currently preparing and getting as much data available so that we can start off with a kickoff meeting that has the data that we currently have available as well as other other resources such as park and planning and other um, data sources that census uh, etc that we think are relevant but this plan and the timeline is um, one that will, that is the proposal, the best guess proposal from our um, respondents and will be modified based on that initial kickoff meeting that happens both with the commissioners and with staff. And did we have any follow-up to find out why that company didn't participate in the orals? We don't. Yeah, they did. Uh, you know, we went back to each respondent to ask for a best and final price, and they did provide an updated uh, pricing. So, but we did make several attempts to contact them right. uh, using the same contact information. Other questions? Um, on on the price, I guess I'm just trying to understand the the scoring. Uh, I mean. Fees, it, it, it does look like public works is one of the higher cost uh, ones, if not the highest. But um, but then if I'm reading your note correctly, uh, I mean, you're also saying Prim, Prim course scored the highest due to the sheer number of hours it, it proposes to dedicate to the engagement. So I, you're saying is they, they didn't score the highest in our scoring, but you're saying that uh, the cost of the value of uh, that per hour is, so, is, um, is that what so you're for, is? Yes. So for developing the plan, they propose um, 31 hours to allocate, I'm sorry, 3,100 hours to allocate to the plan. And so based on their dollar, um, their hourly rate um, was really low and therefore they were awarded the highest uh, points for fees. Well, they, well, okay, so the highest points for fees, fees that's yes. that's not reflected in the 20 points um, for Primco mm -hmm. for fees and where the fee might have been more expensive, you see the reduced amount of score for, for those other respondents. Oh, I see. oh whoops. okay, I, I was misreading this. So, sorry. Um, I, I thought we were talking about public works. But, um, okay, so public works is kind of in the middle proposing fewer hours and when when compared to from what okay. it's not based on hours what they did was take the number of hours divided by what the overall mm -hmm. uh, proposal amount was to determine per hour rate okay. and so a company like steady state that might have had three employees actually has one of the highest uh fees when you calculate the number of hours that they've proposed to the project okay so public works has a higher cost per hour um, yes then 
and excuse me, steady state had had the highest. Ha right. Yeah. No, I understand. So it's just in terms of who we're selecting. Um, but I'm also hearing you say that if uh, that we may have ways of bringing some of that cost down. Um, is it just in interviews or will there be other areas where if it takes them less time? We'll, uh... well, we anticipate negotiating with them um, based on our assessment of what and how much staff we would need at different phases. So, for example, if in the beginning stages we're just wanting to have exploratory conversations with staff, we don't need their full complement. Um, and so most of the proposals considered having their full complement staff from beginning to end of the process of the process. And so, um, of course, we would consider all of the various ways in which we could negotiate to our best uh, efforts um, with them. Okay. I, I'm just trying to, is this, is this a fixed fee or is it a, it's a, it, it's a not to exceed? Not to exceed. Uh, okay. Great. Um, on the, Matters dealing with the uh, phase two, the implementation plan, and what you are proposing is that uh, that some decision be made about that after the completion of the strategic plan. And I just think so important. The operational plan is really, to me, a very important part of this initiative. We we saw it was important enough to make it included as a definition of work in the original RFP. And I would not like to wait until the completion of the strategic plan to think that we're going to have a potential gap between the completion of the plan and then creating the operating plan. If there's a way that we could, for example, if, if the contractor you are recommending for this um, is public works, they submitted a proposal, a bid for the phase two. There's going to be some negotiation with them before we sign a contract, as you already are saying. And it's possible for us to put into the full discussion phase one and phase two. You may want to put a contingency on when we pull the trigger to authorize phase two, but I'd like to have it so that it covers both phase one and phase two and to see if we could find tune this so we can get down perhaps within the maximum amount of the contract we're proposing. No, as, as an option. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore, when a motion is presented, it would be to include um, a, a potential increase of 87,000, um, the option to add phase two for an additional 87,000 and for our um, attorneys to craft the contract that allows us to have and reserve the right on whether we do um, make that next. Um, See, I would almost approach you by saying that without agreeing on an amount of $87,000, I would make a motion to approve this resolution at a maximum amount of cost of $425,000, including phase one and phase two. And for you all to negotiate that. Or I'd say $400,000 when you negotiate it, but I'm just saying I want it negotiated with phase one and two included in what we do. Let's consider that. I, I know that the planning board just went through this thrive state and it was exceedingly controversial uh, in, if I understand correctly, they ended up sending it back for more public input. And there was criticism of the inadequacy of the the public input. Now, admittedly, that's for a 30-year plan. We're looking at a five-year plan, but I wonder what on earth, if if there's any guidance here as to the proportionate costs. I This seems like a staggering amount of money to me. On the other hand, I see it as um, something that's really important to do because I think we have reached a point in our history where we really need to do a, almost a stop. Let's examine where we are, be confident of it, and 
carefully think out. That's why the five years bothers me. I, I think there should be a grander plan beyond that. But, um, you know, you can't get very specific on beyond five years. Uh, the, the world's just moving too fast. So, um, but I would be very interested to know perhaps before you enter into negotiations that you do a little work on what the Thrive process went through and why there was such a public rejection of that, um, that question. I mean, it, it appeared that a lot of people were very upset that there was a lot of vocal people. A lot of vocal people. That, <laughs> thank you for that. That's a good clarification. But I think it would be interesting to know what costs went into that and with the additional time and effort they put into it, what they ended up paying for it. Um, that might give you some perspective on how that fits in because that was a huge undertaking as well. And I think this is certainly projecting a huge undertaking. And since Thrive is controversial, it's gonna to continue to be controversial. Um, and it's just so close in timing to doing that. I, I would hate to have us fall subject to the same kinds of criticism, particularly when we're talking about this kind of money. So I don't know where you know, I I hear you, but I, I think I don't think we can compare Thrive yeah, to Earth for Teacher, please. Not at all. I mean, this is Apple to Great Food. Uh, <laughs> Thrive is so much larger and uh, and so affects this whole county in different ways. I mean, it's talking about growth of the county over decades. Yeah. Uh, and it also gets to issues that the community has density and all of those factors. Uh, I, so I, I really don't think that there's any way to compare it. I do agree with you that $500,000 is a staggering amount. And I had never anticipated it to be this much. I guess the question that I would have related to that is two questions, really. One, have we done any analysis or comparison with any other agents, any other entities that have done potential plans to know that this is a reasonable price? And do you think this is a reasonable price? I would like to address that for a moment if I could. Um, I spent a lot of my time in healthcare doing strategic planning for organizations, granted, usually significantly larger than HOC is. And um, dealing with much broader geographies than HOC is dealing with. This price does not surprise me at all. In fact, one of our competitors was known that they would not touch a project for less than a million dollars. And a big question that everyone was, you know, when they went out for their strategic planning consultants was, are you gonna be willing to pay the million buck fee for this particular uh, company or not? because if not, they wouldn't even bid on the job. It, it's a very intensive kind of work. You were mentioning the data and are they gonna get all that data done in two weeks? The way they do it is they have a lot of staff that they pour on for a certain amount of time to look at those kinds of things. And it's very staff intensive work. So I have to say from what I did in a different industry on a different uh, size of organization, the price doesn't surprising. I, I would speak from having done a strategic plan uh, in, in one of my previous life for a similar agency, much smaller, um, that um, we spent over a quarter of a million dollars for a much smaller agency um, and took a lot longer time to do it because of the fact that we didn't, we couldn't, what, if we had done what they're supposing to do with the size of staff they had, we would have spent probably $400,000. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, the time frame they're talking about, I don't think that, and the price points they're talking about per person consultant, and that's something you all can negotiate about whether you need to have this many people doing this assignment and how you do that. Uh, you can find some savings, I think. Um, but it, it, we're, we're in the ballpark with price for doing the teaching plan. They, 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 they vary depending upon what you want, intensity of it, how many people you want involved in it. So I think we're in the yeah. ballpark here. Yes, and I, that's fine. The board that you actually anticipated it being approximately 400,000. Um, and so that is really um, where we are um, in terms of pricing. So when you initially thought about what this might cost at some point prior to my arrival, you were also around the same ballpark as well. You know, we talk about feel much better based on Fran and Roy's comments about perspective. I was looking for perspective, and the only model I had was Fran. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, uh, because we don't I appreciate that perspective as well. I mean, it's interesting because given the volatility of what we as an agency have faced over the last few years, uh, it's almost like you should be doing an annual plan. Okay, because it's, it, it's, it changes so dramatically. And we, we, and we, of course, once we adopt this plan, just like the PHA plan is required by HUD, they require an annual update on that plan every year. And so we should look at when we go yeah, forward yeah. and adopt this plan, what we're going to do, and that falls into the operational side okay. of this plan. Monitoring and that's, why, and that's why that's so important to me that we have that mechanism in place to do that. And so um, when this is brought back to us, I hope we can find a way to fashion some language that allows us to do phase one and phase two, and we can set a dollar amount for what that looks like. This is presented today for action. Um, is it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, it's a resolution. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. So that we could get started. They want to get started. started. Well, it's April. We want to get started. What was that? Yeah. Well, I just sort of the recommendation is. What is the recommendation? I'd like to move approval of resolution 2326, which is the approval to select and negotiate a contract with Public Works LLC for the development of HOC's fiscal years 23 through 2028 strategic plan in accordance with RFP 2358. Did you want to modify that? Yes. You want to I, yeah. I want to modify that to include the uh, the achieving phase one and phase two activities uh, for a maximum price amount of four hundred twenty five thousand dollars. I accept your amendment. Is, is that enough? Is we have that to enough? vote on the amendment. That's a maximum amount. Yes, it's up to number. was four hundred thousand. Well, was the without the implementation, it was. Close to four hundred thousand. Yes, it was what three. Uh, and, and they were saying eighty-seven thousand four. I'm going to go that. It's right here right. in our yeah, because yeah, the implementation was eighty. What was it? Eighty-seven. But you want them to negotiate it by her. Yes, correct. My recommendation is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's a maximum amount. Yeah, I would recommend for phase one and phase two. Okay. Shall we vote on the amendment? Yeah. Yes, sir. There are also that amendment to amendment to resolution 82236. I second. Statement from the. Yes, record. I just want to add some additional consideration and make sure that I'm clear because as I go back to negotiate, if um, we're unable to negotiate both phases within the amount that is being proposed, um, it might cause delay in a result of coming back to this board. So I just want to um, be clear. Of course, I understand the board's intention to stay within um, and not exceed $450,000. And that is where um, I will, and the team will work to negotiate. Um, but I do want to ensure that at a minimum, we have what we need to move forward with phase one of this um, uh, proposal and would ask the board to consider um, potential friendly amendments to ensure that we are able to at least get that phase one completed with the goal of the staff working hard to negotiate both phases within four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. 
I um, vote to keep it separate, honestly. I think it's going to be a little hard to agree with um, executive director to include the implementation of it. Um, I'm not sure. I understand your concern, Roy, and perhaps that may give some negotiation powers. But at the same time, you have not seen the finished product. Uh, and to me, if they write and develop a strategic plan as well as they should have, that's one of my concerns is how are you going to know what the finished deliverable is? It how, to, how are you going to evaluate it that is what you wanted? And so to me, the implementation really should uh, be defined enough that our operations that picks it up and they're able to go with it. So the implementation piece is a little fuzzy for me, which is why I would prefer to keep it separate as they presented it. And I, th I mean, I, I understand your point and agree with your point, but I want phase one and two done. I'm not willing to, my, my food, my vote is contingent upon us getting phase one and phase two done. So and if, if, that, if that can be done, then bring it back to us. You can't negotiate within the $450,000 we want to do for phase one and phase two, bring it back to the commission. If I may, in, in their proposal, they did include 87,000 to mm -hmm. prepare an implementation plan. So that's in addition to their 361. So if we right, we, which is what I'm saying, like that was an additional amount. Mm -hmm. So now Commissioner Priest wants it up to 450 for right. all of it. Right. And so, you know, are we willing to pay eighty-seven thousand dollars for an implementation plan? I think that's more concerning than, than anything. Like you again, you're writing a strategic plan. And so it should be done to the point where hopefully staff should be able to write an implementation plan from it. I don't understand why it needs to be a separate plan, well, but because I'm not fact, in operations. So. Yeah, because of the fact that to get this done, we, we're going to invest as much money we are talking about investing in the plan. We should know how we're going to have it implemented and monitored. Okay. I mean, that, and, and, and that's not a staff function. The staff, right. we don't have the staff to do that. I have to say we don't have the expertise. We don't have the staff dedicated to be able to do that. You're also, you're not proposing that we commit to them doing the implementation at this point. It's only, it would only be an option that we would be able to trigger at some point if we were satisfied with the yeah. work that they've done in phase, yeah. phase one. And just to um, give some examples of what implementation looks like in staff capacity. For example, if we determine that there are certain metrics or even dashboards or public accountability that we want to put on our website in regards to how we're ch achieving our different um, strategic goals, if we want to update our performance measures across all of our staff, they would assist with looking at how do we implement um, this in our performance measures per division based on what those different goals are that we've set out. So that's the implementation element um, that they would assist with. Um, but I do agree that we want to first ensure that they've met our satisfaction with phase two. I'd ask for in the um, proposal with the reservation um, to trigger phase two. Um, phase two, of course, um, won't happen for quite some time. And I think once we get to that phase, we'll know that they meet our satisfaction. If, if they did, if we don't want to, um, uh, if we want to give ourselves the flexibility and put that in the contract at this time, I think that we can do that. My main concern is to um, um, be in a posture where if we're negotiating for the entire amount that does not include what they've identified as their best and final, which we did ask for best and final, that we might find ourselves back here in May um, reevaluating how to proceed. And I do want to at least get started with phase one um, and, and totally agree with what you're indicating um, uh, Commissioner Priest in terms of making sure that whatever we enter into gives them the understanding that our full intention is to do phase one and phase two. 
Well, yeah. we need some language crafted to be able to do that because, see, I, they submitted the best and final. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't signed a contract with them. Correct. Okay. And I'm saying, we're saying that there's a way that we can negotiate some other considerations just by your own admission. You indicated that there are certain scopes that they have identified in terms of the number of personnel that could reduce the amount of this bid. And I think you've got to go through that detail and resolve what the final number is going to be for phase one. I have no problem establishing that we would look like to do phase one and two. The awarding of phase two would be a contingency that we do at a later time. You want to write a language to that effect? Fine. But I am not willing to say that I'm willing to accept anything in terms of their dollar amount that you have negotiated with them finally. I mean, is that, I mean, I don't think it's going to be unreasonable with that. Well, is, is your concern about um, doing the whole negotiation now about not wanting to have any delay in the implementation phase? That's right. And I guess I'm wondering then, does separating it like if, if we do just the strategic plan now and hold off on approving the implementation portion, does that, is that going to delay us in any way? Uh, I mean, I guess I, I'm hearing the chair's concern that, you know, we want to get this done and we want to do I this think in so. as speedy yeah. way as possible. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, does, do we get it done faster by doing it all the, all the negotiations up front, or is it going to do, or, or is there not really much difference if we negotiate the second part later? So, um, Kayleen, was there a reason why the implementation was separated out? I, I think we wanted to give um, ourselves the flexibility um, of self-performing or do it on a, on a um, uh, limited scope or or have them fully uh, implementing it, but we, we fully intend to implement the, the plan. So so that's the only the only reason. Yeah, when when we wrote the RFP, we separated those two phases, uh, and we asked for separate uh, right. pricing. Um, phase one, the RFP had a much greater uh, degree of detail about what the agency was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, phase two was a little more broad um, and a little less detailed. So I think that's one of the other, um, there was a lot more variation in terms of the proposals for phase two. Um, so did you somewhat leave it open that perhaps another firm could help implement it? Is that somewhat was your idea or your thinking? The way the RFP was structured, you know, there would be two separate, uh, it would be kind of, you know, as the commission has been discussing, moving forward with phase one, mm -hmm. with an option to move forward with phase two. Um, and so as we were discussing how to present it, uh, I think the executive director um, decided to put phase one before the, the board now with the idea that as we get to uh, close to the, the uh, finalizing the strategic plan, then there would be, you know, uh, additional board meetings and opportunities for the, the board to evaluate whether they're happy with for, the consultant. For me, for me if, if we proceed with phase one, and then, uh, and the way this is language written is that phase two would not be decided upon until we've completed the strategic plan. That bothers me, okay? I don't like that language. We will not do it until we complete the strategic plan. Because if you would come back to the, to the to this commission and say, well, we don't think that this firm can do phase two, then I question why they're doing phase one. Well, Commissioner, 
priests, if they are not performing to our satisfaction, coming back to this board much uh, sooner than the end of their work, um, seeking to um, terminate their contract and to select another contractor. Mm -hmm. So that's how we would approach that. The thinking here is, and, and there was very um, specific language in the RFP and quite frankly from commissioners about wanting to ensure that there's a point in time where the commissioners approve the strategic plan before we move to the next phase. And so holding that um, line of rationale, ensuring that we were not overstepping as staff to go to phase two and that we got the thumbs up from the commissioners that we were satisfied with where we were with the strategic plan is why we chose to bifurcate. Um, I believe our general counsel is able to craft a contract that can address the concerns that are being raised in terms of ensuring that both elements are included in this contract. Where we're kind of at an impasse is how do we approach the funding situation, whereas what's being proposed does not cover the full amount of what they have indicated as their best and final, which would take us to close to 487000 if we were negotiating the full amount with no contingency, you know, with a little bit of contingencies um, based on what they've um, proposed. And so um, bringing that down to 450, we can definitely go forward with trying to negotiate. Um, I'm just concerned about if we're able to be, if we find that negotiating um, both phases becomes problematic because we've cut down um, somewhat in terms of phase two, um, being able to have the authority to move forward with phase one and come back to the board about phase two. And there's a question. Under our procurement requirements, are we required to have to accept a best and final as a final price for this engagement? No, in fact, you're authorizing, this is not to exceed. So you're authorizing me to go and negotiate. I am hopeful to come back and indicate that we were able to negotiate for less than this amount. However, so we're not obligated to accept that, but obviously if we go back and want to negotiate and we're unsuccessful, then I'm coming back to the board because I don't have the approval to go higher than what the board has authorized me to negotiate. Well, so if I, I heard you correctly, so two options we may have. One is to go back and negotiate the 380 plus amount. And then secondly, is to ask perhaps for a best and final for both phases. We asked for best and final for both phases you already. So you already yes, did yes. that and that's where the 87,000 came from. Both of the breakdown that we received okay. is a reflection of their best and final. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll ask a, a, just a quick question. If, if we didn't include the implementation in the contract now, uh, do we, is is that below the limit uh, in which we'd have to put out another RFP for implementation or? The 87,000 actually falls within my um, okay. uh, contracting authority, but because this is strategic planning, of course, I would bring it to the board. And but we wouldn't necessarily have to put it out. Like if we wanted to continue yes, with public right. works, yes. we wouldn't have to. Well, let me do this. I'm not. I'm not trying to be dogmatic here anyway. I'm trying to find a way to, to get to get done what I'm trying to suggest we do. And I'm going to make an amendment to allow that we proceed with phase one of the implementation, not to exceed four hundred thousand dollars, and for the staff to bring back within the midpoint of the first phase a recommendation on the second on implementation of phase two. Okay. Is that a motion? Phase one would not to exceed 400000 But my understanding is that 361 includes a $36,000 contingent. No, it does not. No, that's what I'm talking about. That's on tap. Yeah, it's 361 plus 36000 I'm just trying to round this up. I hate to be on the low. No one is at it. Right, right. So the total with the contingency is 397000 I think we should keep the motion separate, though. And you give them the action to come I'm back. Done the, I've, given them, I've given them the approval of phase one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So and we can proceed. I'm asking the staff to come back in the midpoint of the strategic plan with a recommendation on phase two. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're going to keep resolution 2326 as is then. No. 
Well, no, the language that amended is approved phase one at an amount of four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, with the staff to report back to the commission on the proceeding with phase two in the midpoint of the implementation okay. of the of the, of the strategic plan. Is, is that is that? So you're making that motion, and and then we. I'm making that motion. Okay. And a substitute motion. Do I have a second? I'll second so we can vote. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the substitute motion? Aye. Approved by aye. 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 Who is name? Okay. Motion carried. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next item is the resolution 23-27 bond underwriter selection. Did we do the final? That was an amendment. Do we still have to? Yes. Uh, the amendment. His Yeah. So we're approving the amended resolution. Yeah. The amended no. resolution yeah. 23 26. All right. Just checking. Okay, Thank yeah. you. Just be clear. We're, we're approving the amended resolution 23 26. Yes, commissioners. And there will be an updated resolution that will reflect what was just voted upon. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, resolution 2327. Commissioners, um, this is a recommendation to move forward with our bond underwriting team. Um, this proposal comes um, not through committee, but um, in past practice comes directly to the full board. Um, it's a very robust process of evaluating potential um, financial institutions that can provide the support that we need for our bond underwriting work. And I will turn it over to our mortgage finance team to provide details. Thank you, Executive Director Andrews. Uh, good afternoon again, commissioners. Uh, today we're before you. Uh, to present the commission for the approval of firms selected to serve on the commission's bond underwriting team. Uh, Jennifer Washington will present. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Jennifer Washington, Assistant Director of Bond Management. And in January of 2019, the commission appointed a new bond underwriting team. The, in January 2019, the Commission appointed a new bond underwriting team. And each firm's contract expires on May 28, 2023. The bond underwriting team helps to structure HOC's bond issues and markets the bonds to obtain the most favorable pricing so that the loans made with the proceeds of the bonds promote the financial feasibility of HOC's single family and multifamily financing programs. The current team includes, includes six investment banks. Um, oh, page 151, please. Um, listed here on page 151. Bank of America Securities is, is our senior manager. PNC Capital Markets is our co-senior manager. And the remaining team members are all co-managers. Consistent with the procurement policy, on October 31st, 2022, a request for proposal was published and emailed to 32 investment banking firms. And on November 22nd, 2022, 12 proposals were received, including those firms currently on the team and six new applicants. You can scroll down just a little bit. Thank you. Um, an evaluation team comprised of two commissioners, the executive director, the deputy executive executive director, staff from mortgage finance, finance in the real estate divisions, along with assistance from HOC's financial advisor, Kane Mitter, was established to review the proposals, conduct interviews, and recommend a new team and its structure. Page 154. Each proposal was reviewed to ensure it met the minimum qualifications of the solicitation. However, upon review, two firms did not meet the minimum requirements as it relates to housing finance agency experience and therefore were not scored. Page 155. The remaining 10 firms were reviewed, evaluated, and scored based upon the following evaluation criteria. Staff from mortgage finance, finance, and real estate participated in scoring. Page 159. While the cost of while the cost for a bond underwriter is typically made up of three categories: management fee, 
takedown or the fee paid to co-managers in the selling group for selling bonds and underwriting expenses. Those that scored only those that scored, meaning mortgage finance, finance, and real estate, only considered each firm's proposed management fee, given that each firm assumed its own bond structure in their proposal. Page 160. With preliminary scores, scores completed on January 24th, the evaluation team determined that those investment firms that scored 70% and above would be interviewed on February 7th and February 8th. Those that scored 70% and above were all the existing six banks on the team, plus TD Securities. Topics in the interviews included the marketing of bonds, any additional financial services that the firms may offer, and bond structuring recommendations, among others. Page 161. Following the interviews on March 3rd, 2023, the evaluation team discussed the final scores, the recommended makeup of the bond underwriting team, and the team structure. Page 162, after considering each proposal, the presentation of interview topics, the, pro the proposed team from each team and the aggregate scores, staff recommends that the commission accept the recommendation of the evaluation team and select all seven firms, firms that were interviewed, including Bank of America, Jeffries, Morgan Stanley, PNC Capital Markets, RBC Capital Markets, Wells Fargo Securities and DD Securities. Page 163. With respect to structure of the bond underwriting team, the evaluation team proposes a structure that, one, puts in place a strong team to structure and market commission's bonds, two, gives the commission the most flexibility for a team that would be assigned for each bond issuance, and three, creates incentives, incentives among all the firms to bring the best ideas, innovation, and innovation that, that maximizes the bond program's effectiveness. With the proposed structure as shown, each firm has the opportunity to be the senior manager for, for a transaction. However, the ability to market the bonds and the proposed structure for each bond issue will be closely evaluated. <clears throat> Therefore, staff recommends that the commission approve the proposed structure, which initially includes a senior manager, Bank of America Securities, a co-senior manager, Capital Markets, LLC, and between 0, 7, 0, 06 co-managers making up the remaining of the teams which would be determined upon each bond issuance. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Um, I have a question. How do you change the senior manager for the transactions? So uh, reading uh, your first sentence that each firm has the opportunity to be the senior man, would it be around Robin? Like it's Bank of America, would it go to the next one? So um, for each bond issue, there could be um, a recommendation by an underwriter for a particular structure, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, when we did um, West Side Shady Grove or the Lorette, um, it was a proposal from Wells Fargo to do the FHA risk sharing um, uh, uh, green bonds, okay? And we had never done one of those before. And it was the first in this country so Wells Fargo was the senior manager on that transaction. Okay, thanks. Okay. It doesn't mean that they will necessarily get paid. Right. It yeah. provides staff the opportunity to make a, a different senior manager depending okay. upon the circumstances okay. of the development. Okay. okay. Can I get a resolution? Uh, uh, motion to approve resolution 23 27. I move approval of resolution 2327. Second. And probably move the second to approve resolution 2327. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All this nay. So ordered. I want to take a moment and acknowledge Jennifer Washington and the outstanding, outstanding work that she did in this procurement mm -hmm. and in putting together the meetings, the teams, the comments, the preparations were done for it. And Jennifer, I just want to say it was an outstanding work. And I want to just compliment you for what you did. Mr. Priest. Arlene, it's a good job. Yeah. Arlene, oh, thank you. Going for the after this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like it's well earned. Thank you. Did we have a motion? Thank you.
<laughs> Emotion and an emotion. <laughs> okay, the next item coming up before us is a presentation of the FY HOC FY two oh two four twenty twenty four recommended budget. No resolution here, this is a presentation, correct? Correct. Commissioners, I'm pleased to uh, provide you with the recommended FY 2024 um, budget. We will supplement this um, uh, report with a more detailed and full comprehensive report, similar to what was published last year. Um, that will come out sometime next week. So we'll publish it both to the commissioners as well as to the public. In addition to that, we will be engaging in meetings with our budget um, audit and finance committee meeting over the next few months, providing much more detail as it pertains to each of the items in this budget. Those meetings are also open to the public as well. And so just acknowledging that process in which we will then return back to the full board in June for a recommendation for the adopted budget for FY24. I do wanna start by sharing some context as it pertains to where we are, where we've been. Um, in this packet, if you um, happen to get to page 179, um, you saw that there was uh, an overview or an introduction to this budget proposal for you and where we um, believe we are. Um, the context that was set in, in this memo um, that was so eloquently crafted with a number of my staff support, I want to thank our Deputy Executive Director and my Director of Public Affairs for working with me on this, um, but ultimately just acknowledging that our agency has had um, great success in the midst of turbulent times. Um, and, and it's because of the strong foundation that you as commissioners and with the support of staff that we've laid. Um, and so the path of resilience during uncertain times is reflected as we look at what we've been able to accomplish and where we're headed. Um, there's a theme of what we have done, even in the midst of these uncertain times, to innovate and create new programs and new access um, for our residents. Um, I'll start by just giving some highlights in terms of accomplishments, which are always provided in our monthly reports and just reiterate what some of those new accomplishments over this last year included, um, included new methods of how to get out financial resources to individuals experiencing housing instability through our um, rent assistance, rental assistance programs and other funding sources such as the CDDG and emergency rental assistance programs, resources we receive from FEMA, as well as the innovative new housing production fund that has created a nationally um, recognized program that was um, provided to us by our council members in the amount of over $100 million to support the work around production. Additionally, we have some new construction projects that we are cutting ribbons on here in the very near future. The Laureate, which is our 268 unit mixed income, mixed um, use new construction project located in Rockville, where we are currently leasing up residents steps away from Shady Grove Metro, um, and will also be the site of our new Up County Service Center. So looking forward to um, our staff having the opportunity to relocate to that beautiful property. We also have the Leggett, um, which we are all very proud about, um, and it is new construction for our seniors and provides affordable housing for our seniors, 267 units, 16 stories high, um, and will also um, be combined with the South County Recreational, Regional Recreational and Aquatic Center, as well as Holy Cross Wellness Center, um, and will be located in Silver Spring and expand Elizabeth Square. And that's where the people from Elizabeth House will be living by the time we demolish. Absolutely. They are probably situated in their brand new homes. We will do a head count at the ribbon cutting. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Kelleher. Um, really excited and we'll be celebrating the um, ribbon cutting and the naming of the Leggett um, here in um, um, May. 
In addition, we have new construction projects, the Hillendale projects that, that we've talked about repeatedly, as well as Goncourt Farms Department that reflect the work that we've done to not only develop affordable housing, but to be a leader as it pertains to environmentally friendly and innovative um, projects across this region. Um, we continue to do work as well around preservation as um, uh, occurred most recently with the acquisition of both Bradley Boulevard Apartments and Battery Lane Apartments, preserving 401 in, uh, units in the Bradley Boulevard Apartments and 212 naturally occurring affordable units in, Brad, in Battery Lane, which are both located in Bethesda. Um, our housing finance agency that you just heard from also has done remarkable work during this time, has produced over um, $560 million in outstanding bonds for developments that we own, as well as the work that has taken place to provide additional resources and over th $30 to $40 million worth of low-income um, single-family home mortgages and $2.5 million in closing costs. Um, those bond proceeds do go directly to supporting the work that we do in um, developing and expanding affordable housing. Um, and um, recognizing some of the challenges that our customers have, have faced, especially during the pandemic related to digital inequity, um, we have worked hand in hand with the county to initiate a new um, broad initiative broadband initiative that provided additional um, computers and access to technology to our residents and continue to work towards getting and obtaining state support to expand this program. Our HOC Academy continues to shine bright in terms of the programming that it provides to both our youth as well as our adults um, in terms of workforce development and entrepreneurial opportunities, um, STEM and STEAM um, training and um, programming, as well as our fatherhood initiative that actually during the pandemic received even more participation than in the past because of online access. And um, it, as a result, we're continuing that platform and that model. Um, our family self-sufficiency program has continued to grow and provide additional supports to our um, residents who've enrolled. And now, as we think about our path forward, we are gearing up for our five-year strategic planning process. Um, we are going to have the ability to continue to use the new and existing housing production tools that are being afforded to us by our county partners, as well as at this particular stage, we have to and need to continue to explore new ways to grow our revenue from both our real estate and mortgage finance fees while stabilizing our revenue from our properties. Um, we intend to do that by way of focusing in on both our property management team and our newly created um, asset management team that will help to stabilize our properties. Um, in addition to providing resources to our clients to ensure that they are um, financially secure and have the resources they need to fulfill their best um, outcomes. The impact of our budget um, in terms of our next year, you will see an increased um, focus on our technology needs. And hopefully that comes as no surprise, but the need to ensure that our technology is top notch is in, important and is key. Um, that includes um, new tools and resources, but as well as um, ensuring that we are um, protecting the intellectual property of our residents, that we're prepared to um, guard ourselves against the cybersecurity threats and that we have an infrastructure that um, will not be impacted by any potential threats or harm to our IT structure. At the same time, we have to maintain our stable workforce. And as reflected in the um, preamble of this memo, um, of course, we were also impacted by the great resignation and many staffing changes over the course of the pandemic. And so uh, and a, a focus on retention and re uh, recruitment is key. This budget reflects a 7% increase in terms of expenditures, and that is directly related to rising costs, but also our ongoing commitments to improve housing and services within each of the um, areas that I've discussed. 
um, issues for consideration include our um, recommendation to the board. And again, this will go through our um, budget finance um, committee and then back to the board, but it reflects um, $331.8 million in our operating budget and a capital budget of $255.5 million. Um, I would like to thank our um, budget team, our finance team, who has done a yeoman's effort to prepare this budget for the board's consideration and looks forward to, of course, engaging with our um, our, our committee and coming back to the board, but has done a great deal of work to get us to this stage and would like to turn it over to um, uh, Tim Gettinger, our acting CFO, as well as Terry Fowler, our budget officer, to provide some high level overview of what is um, before you. Well, before Tim starts, um, in terms of just overview, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and newsprint about the missing middle. And I have been wondering why they act as though this other jurisdiction is doing something that has never been done before. They never refer to what we have been doing in Montgomery County, the HOC, with our missing middle initiative. And, and so that should be in our list of accomplishments because I, 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 I've been intending to write an editorial about that, you know, you all act like this is some new ground. We, we were the trailblazers here, yeah. okay? Absolutely. And 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 uh, I don't want somebody else to feel that thing. So on the record, I want to be clear that <laughs> our opportunities commission of Montgomery County <laughs> now initiated Maryland initiated the missing mineral conversation and project. Let's be on the record about that, okay? You hear that? Uh, so yes, absolutely. The standard sure. train missing the press. I would just like to express my admiration for the eloquence and the clarity with which this budget was introduced. Um, I think I mentioned to our executive director that I wish I had had the budget presented to me in this way when I first came on the commission because I feel I would have had a much better grasp and competency and ability to contribute. And I just understand it was a collaboration and I think she did a remarkable job of you know, the clarity with which you present the need and demonstrate the need is extraordinary. Job very, very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Tim? I don't even know if I need to say anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, Executive Director Andrews and the Commission. Uh, I also want to thank and recognize the budget team uh, for compiling this recommended budget, which is nearly $600 million in aggregate uh, with a budget of this size and complexity is easy to focus on individual aspects, funds, numbers, and narratives. But what I do want to point out is that with a budget of this size and breadth, our economic impact on the county cannot be understated. We, we make a difference. The recommended budget seeks to address the numerous challenges such as interest rates and inflation that the agency will face, but it also affords us with many opportunities to accomplish our mission. I again want to commend the budget team, which as Executive Director Andrews mentioned, is working hard to finalize the recommended budget book. Last year, we published the book for the first time in over a decade, and I'm pleased that, again, we'll soon be propagating the book. And in doing so, we will continue to provide a high level of fiscal transparency and operational transparency. And with that, to provide operational highlights on the recommended budget is Terry Fowler, our budget officer. Terry. Thank you, Executive Director Andrews and Tim. Am I visible? I can do it too. Uh, T team, can you please pin Terry Fowler, our budget officer, on the screen? I have it in front of me. Um, while we are working out the technical <laughs> aspects, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start presenting this. Um, 
For the record, I think I forgot to, for the record, Tim Getzinger, acting CFO, as well as chief development funds officer. Uh, and I will be providing a few highlights from the executive director's FY24 recommended budget. Uh, on pages uh, 178 of your packet, you will see that the FY24 recommended budget being presented today includes a $311.8 million operating budget and a $255.5 million, .5 million capital budget. The budget is balanced with a plan draw from the general fund operating reserve of approximately 1.56 million, primarily due to the continuation of impacts from COVID-19 on rental income receipts and operating expenses. Staff is working through applying the rental assistance that is that has been received to accounts and lease enforcement to shore up our income. On page 192, you will see that grants make up approximately 46.4% or 153.8 million of the operating income of the agency. The majority of this amount is HAP, uh, housing assistant payment subsidy received from HUD. That is 124.6 million for voucher payments to landlords, which is 37.56%. Uh, county funding accounts for another 12.4 million or 3.74% of which 7.97 million or 2.4% is from our county main contract that provides a lot of resident services um, assistance. Another 33.09% or 109.8 million of our revenue is generated by our properties. Management fee and miscellaneous income accounts for approximately 10% and non-operating income makes up for the balance, which is 10.6%. Moving on to the expense side, on page 193, the composition is about 74% or 247 million operational with HAP housing assistant payments, making up the majority at about 38% or 125 million. Issues. The non-operating expenses are comprised of debt service, reserves and various transfers, restrictions and develop, development corporation fees. And I think Terry Fowler is available. Terry, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. I just can't tell. I just couldn't tell if I was visible. But good, good evening, commissioners, executive On page director. 194. <laughs> Page 194 reflects our restricted and unrestricted revenue of about 100 or okay. about 312 million in revenue, okay. uh, approximately 31 million or 9.26% is available for discretionary spending. The restrictions are either grant or bond requirements, debt service or replacement reserves, or internal requirements to cover the cost of operating and maintaining our properties. Tim, for a minute, can you just pause for a moment sure. because we're trying to get Terry on to speak. She's on mute. No, I'm not on mute. You can't not, hear you. She says she's not on mute. I'm not on mute. But, so, but we're not getting audio. Understood. Sorry, Terry. Okay, go ahead. Go as ahead. As long as Terry can hear the accolades that we provided to her, I think we'll let we'll let Tim continue the presentation. Yeah. You provided excellent bullets for me to be able to provide. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, page 195 shows the capital budget for FY24, which is 255.5 million. This is comprised of 10.7 million for improvements and. 244.8 million for capital development projects. The charts on page 196 to 197 shows the distribution of sources and uses. Unlike the operating budget, which does not change much in distribution, the capital budget can fluctuate greatly depending upon the nature of the deals. Please note that the net FY 2024 capital budget includes repayments of over $9 million and $28 million for the OHRF, Operating Housing Reserve Fund, and the LOC line of credit uh, bridge loans, respectively, that are not 
reflected in the chart. As mentioned earlier, we will be going through the budget in detail. Also, uh, Executive Director Andrews noted this as well uh, with the Budget Finance and Audit Committee over the next two months. During these discussions, we will provide updates for any revisions that occur before bringing the FY24 proposed budget to you for adoption in June. To assist you in your process of review, we'll be procedure which is posted on HOC website. Do I have a second? Second. Can we move the second to go into a closed meeting? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Carried. Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you commissioners. <laughs>